Hi guys, I hope you're all safe and keeping healthy. Welcome back to another episode of Vaccinate India. Today we'll be discussing the potential side effects of the COVID vaccines and addressing some of the concerns people might have. Our guest today will also be sharing insights on what it's like to be a doctor during the pandemic. Thank you, Alia. Today we'll be speaking with Dr. Ambarish Satwik. He is a Delhi-based vascular and endovascular surgeon and writer. He is director at the Vascular Cat Lab at Sir Gangaram Hospital and associate professor of vascular surgery. We'll be speaking with him to sort out some of the common concerns as well as myths around vaccinations. Ambarish, a very warm welcome to the intersection. And could you please introduce yourself for our listeners and viewers? My name is Ambarish Satvik. I am a, a, I'm primarily a vascular and endovascular surgeon. I work at Sir Gangaram Hospital, where uh, I'm also the director of the vascular cath lab there. And uh, in addition to that, I write a bit. I I once wrote a novel which was published. What is your sense of the kind of myths and misinformation that is circulating around the COVID vaccine? Look, this is the first time we're trying to stop a pandemic using vaccines ever. And it's also the first time that we've had such a rapid deployment of uh, vaccines. Initially, there, there was a lot of vaccine hesitancy, particularly amongst the healthcare workers. What happened was that the deployment came soon after the fall of the first wave in India. And everybody thought that now that this is behind us, do we really need the vaccine? And a lot of people were hearing all sorts of things about all kinds of adverse effects of the vaccine, and they were confused. For instance, some of our some of our technicians and paramedics uh, who come in from Haryana, for instance, uh, from Sonipat, Bahadurgarh, uh, they would report to work and ask, does this cause impotence? Uh, subsequently, I find that at least amongst the healthcare workers in the month of March, uh, the hesitancy was withering away and more and more people were, were coming uh, forward to receive the vaccine. Do you think the pickup is more due to the sheer devastation that has been happening around? Phase two and phase three, which is now uh, underway, happened with the backdrop of rising infections. So the swell kind of started in March and it was slowly moving train wreck happening in front of our eyes. We could see where this is going. Therefore, it starts picking up. More and more people are interested when the shit hits the fan, which is April. Uh, that's when there's panic. Panic on account of the fact that people feel that the first dose is, is practically not good enough and you suddenly find that a lot of people are completely unvaccinated and therefore unprotected and therefore the panic. And also the realization that the the vaccine is not going to get us out of the second wave. If at all, it's going to stall or uh, give us some sort of protection against the third wave, which is going to happen sometime in the future. Something to be learned from the, uh, the flu pandemic in 1918. Most respiratory mucosal pathogens, if they assume uh, the form of a pandemic, will present with two and a half or three waves because there will be the first wave which will be followed by mitigation measures, in this case, the lockdown, a very strict lockdown in India, perhaps the severest lockdown anywhere in the world. Uh, but the second wave is exceedingly severe because you have a large population that is vulnerable, that hasn't been exposed to the virus. And usually there are mutations which make the virus more transmissible and you have a large vulnerable population. So there's a huge surge in a second wave. Uh, once you're behind that, once, once you're uh, you've moved on, you still have a smaller vulnerable population, which will remain vulnerable if you don't achieve vaccine-induced herd immunity. So small first wave, huge second wave, and usually uh, a third wave, which is intermediate in intensity, if there isn't a vaccine. So this kind of begs the question that if we knew this, that if, if this is common knowledge that respiratory viruses come in three waves, then how is it that a uh, modelers were saying that we are done. So uh, it isn't common knowledge that there will be two and a half or three waves, but mm -hmm. that is how uh, things are likely to play out. Um, now, what happened where the modelers went wrong uh, is that we assumed that the ratio of asymptomatic infections to the uh, symptomatic infections were a factor of about 50 to 60. And based on the number of infections in the first peak, as we were coming down, uh, at least documented 
infections, officially documented infections, we found that a huge uh, chunk of our population, almost about um, 40 to 50 crore people, had been exposed to the virus and they were no longer naive. And this was also being borne out by some of our serological surveys. We thought that high seropositivity, the ratio of asymptomatic to symptomatic people being so high, uh, we thought a large fraction of our population had been exposed. Also, uh, we weren't entirely sure why it didn't hit us the way it hit the global West, how the healthcare infrastructure had been completely ambushed and, uh, and inundated and, and ruined uh, by the surges uh, in, let's say, New York or, uh, or Italy or uh, in Spain and so on, uh, or even in England. Uh, and uh, we were truly, we were rejoicing. We thought that there was something about South Asia that, and the sense of exceptionalism that, you know, there's something completely yeah. exceptional about us that we've completely dodged the bullet. Can you give us some examples in from the past where we have achieved herd immunity? So uh, I'd say that most seasonal flus will disappear because of something like this. We have to understand uh, what the concept of herd immunity is. Herd immunity is not is not immunity that you acquire by osmosis. It is a kind of statistical immunity. So uh, if I'm living in a community where 70% of the people have been previously infected by the virus or have been vaccinated against the virus, all right? Now, because the virus cannot replicate outside of the human host, it needs a human being to survive. Every time it manages to find a vulnerable host in this community where 70% people, people already are immune to the virus, the statistical probability of the virus finding an immune uh, individual is much higher than the probability of the virus finding an individual who, which, who is naive uh, to the virus because 70% are immune, either due to previous infection or due to vaccination. That's what is herd immunity. It's a kind of statistical immunity, a probabilistic kind of immunity where the, the, you know, the, the likelihood of the virus finding a naive host is much, much lesser than the possibility of the virus finding uh, an immune host. So this mystery that we have of why some people are experiencing more severe disease versus others, does this, is this also contributing to why some people are getting infected with the 0.2 variant. So um, before we move on to um, some of these mutants and variants, I think it would help if we try and assess what a successful virus is. Perhaps the most successful virus is the kind that is very efficient in the department of transmission, but isn't particularly virulent, isn't hurtful or death dealing or baneful in that sense. It's in the evolutionary interest of the virus to be more transmissible, but less virulent. And when we say the virus mutates, the virus is mutating all the time. Inside the host, it's mutating all the time. And it is making mistakes while uh, it is replicating. Some of these mutations are not advantageous to the virus, so they'll die out. Uh, and the mutations that are advantageous to the virus towards the direction of less virulence, that it, it, it would not kill off the host. And these are the mutations that survived. All right. So it's not in the interest of the virus to kill off the host. So these mutations, to come back to uh, viral mutations, they are, it's natural selection. It is, it's, it's the virus finding a way of being more transmissible, outcompeting uh, the other variants. And possibly, I mean, usually it is, it should uh, transpire that most viruses will evolve in the direction of greater transmissibility, and it will dial down the virulence, and which is why it will spread itself, which is why the common cold viruses are perhaps the most successful viruses ever, because they don't yeah. kill you, they give you a very mild kind of illness, and you pass it on um, without um, much uh, harm to yourself. So, I mean, so keeping these two things in mind, the severity slash fatality and the transmission rate. And I mean, in the Indian variant, we are seeing that it is definitely more transmissible. Um, but what do we know about the fatality or severity of disease? Is, is that going down as well? Unfortunately, there isn't any great way of quantifying virulence in 
in human um, studies. It's difficult. You can do it in animal studies, but um, but there isn't any clear data to suggest that these variants are at least more uh, virulent than the the wild strain, the ancestral SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, but clearly, yes, we're seeing um, a move in the direction of greater transmissibility, much, much greater uh, contagiousness, several fold increase. Uh, and that is why these, the mutants that have been called the double mutants and the triple mutants, which are, I mean, they're being colloquially called double mutants and triple mutants. Yeah, it's, it's a very, very bad, bad name, name. And that's because of the mutations that are taping, taking place in the uh, in the RBD, the receptor binding domain of the spike protein of the virus, which is um, which is uh, the little appendage that the virus uses to gain entry inside the human cell. Can the vaccine give me COVID? Is it a live virus? Can the virus reconstitute itself in my body and attack me? The vaccine cannot give you COVID. Currently, all the vaccines uh, we have in circulation, most of them don't have SARS-CoV-2. They have a part of the genetic code of SARS-CoV-2, specifically the part of the code that is responsible for the production of the spike protein. What these vaccines are doing are using human cellular machinery to manufacture spike proteins against which the body will subsequently produce antibodies. Covaxin is an inactivated virus. Uh, it cannot replicate inside human beings. It is not live. And therefore, none of these vaccines can give you COVID. Thank you so much. I've taken a lot of your time, Ambarish. I really, really appreciate it. Thank and you. hope that all the vaccine shots, you know, reach very soon and everybody gets it. Thank you. This was delightful. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. If you found this video helpful, then please like, share and subscribe. We'll see you in the next episode of Vaccinate India. Until then, please take care and stay safe.